Here we go. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Tuesday night interviews with special and fascinating people from around the world. And tonight, we in fact have somebody very special, Rabbi of Remy Zippel. If that name sounds familiar, we have had his father, Rabbi Benny Zippel, on. We've had his brother, Rabbi Chaim Zippel. And finally, the simplest of them all, we get Rabbi of Remy Zippel, who's got a Chicago connection and he's got a story to tell. So, Rabbi, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you spending this time with us. And we're looking forward very much to our conversation and hearing about your life. So thank you. That's first of all. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Rabbi Epstein. It, uh, it does can't help but feel like I'm 14 years old again and I'm in the first year of my Mississippi experience in, in, uh, in Chicago. So this is going to bring back some very delightful memories I'm sure this evening. And I'm excited for the opportunity. Okay, great. As we mentioned. Okay, well, Avrami and I have a personal relationship. That goes back way before he even came to Masifta, but we'll leave that out for right now, unless he wants to tell <laughs> that story. But give us some background. So, you know, we know your family are the Shluchim in Utah. You are currently a Shliach in Utah. Give us a little background, set the stage. Where'd you grow up? What's your backstory? So uh, I have the distinction of having, in a certain sense, hosted the first Chabad event in Utah. Uh, my parents moved here. I was just shy of my first birthday. And the first event that they held here in Salt Lake City was my first birthday party, which, as any new shliach knows, babies are a great way to meet people. And uh, it helps, I think, almost normalize you in a certain sense. You know, we're just a nice, normal family that have little kids and we're just trying to find a spot in this community. And so <clears throat> my parents hosted my first birthday party. And uh, there's probably about a dozen or so families at that party, many of whom are still in the community today. And as the oldest, I would say that I grew up, you know, with, with the with the most exposure to the new, fresh Chabad house experience. When my parents started Chabad in Salt Lake City 30 years ago, it was, uh, it was you know, them and their hopes and their dreams and the shirt on their back, and that's about it. And as a child, you internalize quite a bit of that. I think for a lot of kids who grew up in that sort of experience, um, you have you have a reaction on two ends of the spectrum. I think some kids. Um, totally embrace it and and want that to be their lifestyle moving forward and just take to it like a fish to water and some kids run for the hills uh that's just the the reality kind of you know min hakatsa el hakatsa from from one end of the spectrum to the other and i'm grateful to be in the former uh, i think for me growing up in a habada's experience was always something which spoke to me to a certain extent it was always alluring and appealing and, and seemed like something which i wanted to do one day and as Rabbi Epstein mentioned, I'm, I'm grateful for the fact that I have that's close. Uh, my wife, who also grew up in the Chabadat's experience, and I, was something which we were both very passionate about. And uh, About eight and a half years ago, we had that, that opportunity to do that for ourselves. And we work now in my, in my father's Chabad house, alongside them, alongside my parents. And it's something which we had always wanted, and we're grateful to be able to live through till today. So let's talk a little bit about that, because now, thank God, you have children who are sort of in the spot that you were in, but Shlichus has changed drastically. When you were one and two and three, there was no online school, there weren't Zoom, there wasn't the communication. You really were far more isolated in a different way than your children are experiencing. So talk to us a little bit about what your childhood was like in your, when you were your children's age 30 years ago and 25 years ago, and what it's like for them. And you're representative of another generation of shlichas, and they as well as another generation. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't have put that better myself. My, uh, my kids have the opportunity to go to preschool. Uh, you know, my wife and I had a baby six and a half weeks ago, and Mr. Shev in the next few weeks. So my wife goes, thank you. When my wife goes back to work, he'll be in our preschool, uh, in our infant program. And, and so it's interesting. My other two kids, we started the preschool when, when my kids were two and four. Uh, but our youngest now, Shalom, will be in our in our preschool from eight weeks old, nine weeks old, and he'll never know a different lifestyle. And it's interesting, you know, today I got home from Chabad at about 4.30. My wife had to go to a meeting at Chabad, and so I got home to do it with the kids. And at 4.30, after having been home for about 45 minutes, my kids were bored, bored, bored. There's nothing to do. There's nothing to do. What are we supposed to do? We're so bored. We're so bored. And it occurred to me that, <laughs> you know, they had been home for 45 minutes after a stimulating day at school. And we spent the entire day at home. And granted, you know, there were about three hours a day where there was some sort of classroom environment. And my mother was very meticulous about that. There was a space in the room that was dedicated as a classroom. And there was hours that were dedicated to that experience. But for all intents and purposes, we spent the entire day at home. 
And we figured it out. I think as kids, you know, there are certain adaptive skills that when you don't have any sort of other experience, you just, you figure it out, you take to it. Uh, you don't have anything else to compare it to. And so you don't know it to be abnormal. And so we just kind of, we, we went with it, you know, we, we, we were literally homeschooled. Um, <clears throat> as I look back on my siblings, you kind of see the evolution of Chabad's journey through, through technology. And so um, my, the, I'm the oldest, number three in my family joined phone school. I think he was in about fifth or sixth grade, which would become the, the predecessor of online school. And then my sister, who was immediately after him, she was already in online school and, and as were the balance of my siblings. But uh, I did it hardcore um, all seven years, you know, one on one with my mother. There was another younger man who was here for, for a few years to teach us. And it, absolutely representative of a different era, of a different age, just of a different way of doing things. And again, I, I think you don't know better. I think on a certain level, it, it is what it is. And, and you don't yearn for different. I have to say that my parents made a tremendous effort, which I'm grateful for to try and give me some sort of exposure to a classroom. I had good friends who were growing up in Las Vegas and at that point Las Vegas had the makings of a Jewish day school. And so I spent about a week, a year with them just to kind of get the feel of what it meant to sit at a desk and have a teacher and a, and a, and a chalkboard and all that. And to be honest, that felt super huge. Like, I felt strange. Like the, the whole, you know, going to school for six hours, who does that? Like, you know, what kind of animal torture is it to, to put kids in a classroom for six and a half hours? And now I now I do that to my kids, but you know I think I think it's I think it's true of the fact that uh, when you're in a certain generation, when you're living a certain reality, it, it is normal. It, it's what you do, and you you don't think twice. So you're a representative of a really a whole new generation of shluchim. You to you living in Utah is natural. Your parents came to Utah, and people said Utah. What is a rabbi from Italy and a Rebetzin from Toronto, from thriving Jewish communities going to Utah? But you're born and bred Utonian, and it's totally your identity. Is how, you feel like a Utahian, and then these bigger Jewish communities are stranger to you. So how has that adjustment been? Do you feel whatever the word is, Utonian, or like a, you're just a Utah? Well, I'll, I'll make it easier for you. It's U T A H N. Just add the end, and you're good to go. So it's just a Utah. So you feel you're fully embedded in the in the character of that state. Very different than your parents' generation. You know, there's 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 a number of thoughts that I have along those lines. So first of all, I think back um, on one note, kind of taking that idea. Yeah, I think back when I was in the Sifta, and they would bring guests to Masifta from outside the community, from whoever it was, and and throughout my years in Masifta, there was kind of an evolution. You know, there there were like a few. Uh, there were maybe 70 Bachim in the base Medrash. There were you know, a few a few uh, people they'd pluck out to kind of, you know, encapsulate Masifta's mission in a nutshell. Uh, there was me, because I was from Utah, and that was you know, the godforsaken end of the universe at that point. And I had a classmate who was from Australia, who was the first, I think it was the first, you know, the Masifta's first journey across the continental pond, you know, the Masifta brought in a kid from Australia. And, and there were like, you know, four or five of us who, whenever a guest would come in, it was like, oh, you know, here, here's, and I think about the fact that my kid's going to go to Masifta in about six years. And when he's going to be in Masifta, it's going to be like, oh, you're we'll from Utah. to pick him right? up at the airport too? You're going to have to, please, if you don't mind, I'll send you his slide information. But, but you know, at I'm that point, at you, know, you know how to get to O'Hare. I'm very proud of you. At that point, you know, having a kid who's from Utah will be like, okay, good, next. Like, you know, Utah, mm -hmm. it's, 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 who cares at some point? And, and, and so, you know, that, that's a fascinating thought for me. But I think that, I think that one of the incredible realities about Shlichus, to your point, is, you know, for me, growing up in Utah is normal. It, it, has, it has always been normal, and, and it was always a reality and an environment that I wanted to come back to. And I think it's one of the incredible things about Shlichus, that they've ever put families in environments where they could raise their kids, where they could create that, almost that, that island, right, in the middle of nowhere, in, in, in which it, it, it feels normal to raise from Chassidish kids uh, who, who, who one day want to create that world of their own. Um, and, you know, to me, I think about growing up in Salt Lake City and I think about the opportunity that I have to raise now my own kids in Salt Lake City and I would trade nothing in the world for it. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm happier raising my kids in Salt Lake City than I would be raising my kids in, in Crown Heights or Chicago or, you know, the, the larger Lubavitch communities. You know, for me, I think raising them with the realities of Shluchis and with the 
various components of, of being a shliach's kid is, is an incredible gift and one that, that cannot and should not be taken for granted. And to your point, it, it feels it feels natural. It feels normal at a certain point, and you, you can't imagine anything else beside it. If you're embedded into the Salt Lake City, Utah culture and community, I know this led to a rather traumatic experience that you had when you were about four or five years old involving... Um, I don't know if you want to bring up such rough memories. Do you want to share with us the story? Oh, so, about, uh... so sure. No, absolutely. So I, I think we can all relate to the fact, especially, you know, kids from my generation, our parents always had those, those mildly creepy friends, you know, who you, you don't really want to talk much about. So my father had one such colleague who was a degenerate gambler. Uh, and, and, and he and, was so and steeped, advantage of, uh... and he was so steeped in his manipulative ways that he was willing to gamble against six-year-old children. And so when I was six years old in the summer of 1997, uh, the Jazz, the Utah Jazz were playing the Bulls in the NBA finals. And, and my father had this manipulative old friend who who bet me pretty much my life savings on that NBA finals. And he just- You know, the mayors drive. always make a bet. So we thought the Schluchim from Chicago should make a bet. <clears throat> exactly. And, and, and what occurred in that- uh... Uh, so I lost the bet. I lost the bet. Um, Did I call and yeah. rub it in, or was I gentle? And well, I'm it? zooming. I'm zooming with you tonight. Uh, you know, I have I have three kids, and my wife and I are in a one bedroom apartment as we still haven't climbed out of the hole of bankruptcy from that bet. You know, and from the life savings that I lost when I was six years old. But Rabbi Epstein took all my money, my friends. I don't know how 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 and better. Wasn't to say I it. kind enough to call you as soon as the Bulls won to Rabbi, make sure and you Rabbi were Epstein well aware? Needed to remind me that I lost the bet, and, and he felt this was something which was which was worthwhile bringing up. I think at every turn. Welcome to reality, kid. Don't and ever bet against then, Jordan. And then we did it again the next year. It was you know you don't learn from your you mistakes. Don't learn. And so yeah, so you so don't yeah, learn. definitely. Definitely one of the one of the perks of growing up on Shluchas for sure. Yes. But I made it up because I picked you up from the airport when you came to Masif multiple times. So you have a Masif experience, and I, this is a good time to point out with Purim coming up, uh, Bremi laid Megillah for us, and I slept him around the whole city all day on Purim. He thought Purim was for having a Purim Suda. He learned that Purim is for going around the whole city and suburbs to read the Megillah for many many people. He brought that schus to people, which I continued to do, but lesser qualified. Bali Kriya, but you know, we take what we can get. Okay, Abremi, we know that uh, you're doing this great work in Utah. You've gone back to work with your parents, which is incredible. And the idea that you, you didn't grow up on the contrary, no resentment, no like, what did you drag me out here for? And how come we don't live with other firm kids with yarmulkes? So much so that you have perpetuated and brought your children. And you also uh, have a life experience that we want to speak with you about. And you've written a book about it. So I'm just going to open up the floor and please, uh, the best you can, tell us about it. And I'll put a link to the uh, pre order for Remy's book in the chat. But Remy, tell us about, uh, tell us your story. So I appreciate that. I mean, I, I uh, first of all, I, I have to say, um, uh, spending three forums with Rabbi Epstein in all seriousness, and we, we've been plenty humorous tonight, was. It was an experience I, I will never forget. Um, and, you know, Rabbi Epson talks about the fact that he dragged me around from, from dawn till dusk, and, and he did, admittedly. But but he also dragged himself around from dawn till dusk. And, and that was an, an incredible reality to be alongside a shliach for a good 12 hours on Purim Day. Uh, you know, having having had an event the night before and going to an event later that evening, uh, I, I learned a lot. And those were formative years in the Sifta, and I think more than you learn in the classroom environment. And, and you learn from, you know, within an educational setting, you learn a lot from experiences. You learn a lot from being around people and being exposed to certain realities. And those were formative years, and I'm grateful to Rabbi Epstein for that. Um, I, I hesitate to 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 bring this up in the backdrop of being raised on Shluchus. Uh, the reality is that we were all homeschooled, as I mentioned, that we were. <clears throat> at home all day, every day, and there was a need for child care as there were just a lot of us at home. And to that end, my parents hired a caregiver um, at, at, you know, when the, as the family continued to grow. And just around my eighth birthday, the family caregiver began to sexually abuse me. Uh, this was a, a reality which we continued for many, many years. Um, and it was a reality that for many years, I felt the best way to handle, to, to process, to deal with it would be just, you know, direct, total avoidance and denial. And the more that I could believe that it wasn't bothering me and it wasn't affecting me and had nothing to do with me, the better off I would be. Um, I, I can say at this point with a fair amount of certainty, that's not a recipe for success in any way, shape or form. 
uh, and it needed to be dealt with. It needed to be, you know, there, there was a, a process of healing that needed to begin. There was a process of recovery that needed to, be, needed to begin. And I'm grateful for the opportunity that I had to engage in that healing process. At some point in that healing process, it, it led to reporting, uh, going to law enforcement, and then all of the uh, things that that emanate from that point forward. And it was a journey of about altogether uh, from, from the beginning of the healing process until the judicial process wrapped up was about a journey of about four years. Um, and I, I don't in any, way, in any way insinuate that that journey is wrapped up, certainly not the healing or the, uh, or the recovery. And even the judicial journey is, still has its, uh, its, its peaks and valleys, but it, it was a journey in which I, I learned a lot. Uh, it was a journey in which I think I discovered a lot. I discovered a lot, a lot about myself as a person, as a shliach, as a chassid, as someone who believes in God, uh, as someone who who does their best to promote the Eidushter in a wider setting. It's it's kind of the day job that I signed up for, and <clears throat> as as a lot of that journey was was winding down, I'll never forget exactly where I was the first time someone said to me, "You know, you really should write a book about all this. I mean, this this ride has been insane," and I I laughed. It, I mean, you know, who writes a book? You know, great, great scholars and wise men write books. And, and my grandfather, Lil Shalom, was, was a prolific author. He wrote about 25 books in his lifetime. And I vaguely remember every time we, we used to go visit him, his, 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 the status quo was that Zadie was in his office and he had, you know, this room that was filled from corner to corner with books and manuscripts and pages. It, 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 that was him. That was what he did. He was a full-time author. Yeah. To this day, we talk about the fact that he wrote 25 different volumes with two fingers. Um, Isaiah would write with his two forefingers, and, and he never really mastered the art of the whole typing skill. But you know, writing books was for was for people who did that full time. That wasn't where I was or who I was. That was Rabbi and Emanuel Shachat. That was Rabbi Emanuel Shachat of blessed memory, yes. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, one person brought it up, and then another person brought it up, and, and enough people brought it up that it stopped. It stopped being a joke on some level. Um, and <clears throat> last year, just after Pesach, the opportunity arose for it to really happen uh, in the sense that you know, a publishing opportunity became available, uh, which was a tremendous schus and a tremendous bracha. And it was it, writing it and, and putting it together was, was a remarkable, remarkable process and one that I'm profoundly grateful for. And it is now literally in print. It is at Kipshute as we speak. It is, it is coming off the press. Um, it'll be available, and it's available for pre-order now, as Rabbi Epstein said, and we'll have it in hand on Tuesday, May 23rd, Gimel 7, a few days before Shavuos. And it, it sounds surreal, as surreal as it was. Yeah, I think there were a lot of steps in this process that, that each one felt surreal in its own right. Putting together a manuscript felt surreal, and then going through the editing process felt surreal, and actually sitting down to have it published felt surreal. And, and at every turn that you go through that surreal experience, you you continue to realize that you know there's there's tremendous brachas in this world and there's tremendous opportunities and there's tremendous gifts from on high, and and you try to be grateful for that to the extent possible and you try to you know to realize that and to mold your life in accordance with those gifts from on high, and to to try and help the world as much as you can in the in all of those areas. It's something which I'm profoundly profoundly grateful for. So you've written this book, you, you have your story, which of course is detailed in the book and people are encouraged if they want to know about it. Can you give us a sense as to when did you come to recognize that it was time to come forward? Like what prompted you to say, okay, I have to come forward uh, to law enforcement. I mean, there's all kinds of complications there going on, people questioning, criticisms, experts, hochums, and so on. You knew you would be subjected to that. How did that process play out? So I, I would, I would kind of split that answer into two, um, and and it, it's actually usually when I do zooms, I, I do them from my office. But it's later in the evening already here in Salt Lake City. We're an hour behind, but I was home for bedtime, and so I'm doing the zoom in my living room. And it's actually eerie that you asked that question exactly where I'm sitting. So I'll I'll, I'll split that answer into two. For me, reporting. Um, reporting was almost almost something which I did to check a box. Reporting was something which I did you know, in the first instance, you know, just picking up the phone and calling law enforcement. Felt like I was going to do it just to prove to myself that I could do it. Um, and, um, and that was it. I was going to do it and say, ah, I did it. 
okay. You know, uh, I have a friend who talks about the fact that he was once um, on a on a on a shluchis call. He had just gone out on shluchis with a number of other young shluchim, and at the end of the call, whoever you know, it was, it was a co- it was a, a seminar or a webinar. And someone was encouraging young shluchim to create big goals for themselves and to and to call someone very philanthropic in the community and ask them for you know a, a much larger amount of money than you ordinarily would. So this you know, a friend of mine was like, oh, okay, I'm going to do this. And he picks up the phone and he calls this guy and he asks him for a ridiculous amount of money. And the guy's like, let's do this, absolutely. And he almost like he almost didn't know what to do. Like, he was he was expecting a no and he was almost hoping for a no so he like you know yeah i did it look you know they they said we should call and i called and, and that was it like you know i wasn't expecting to actually go through this and get the check and, and and as i think back you know to the first time i reported it almost feels like that you know i i okay let me do this i'm gonna call and they're gonna say i'm sorry sir this is this is a ridiculous proposition and we can't help you and we don't know why you called and i'd be like okay yeah i did the thing um and that's not what happened uh when but when i think about making the decision to go public with the story. When I went to law enforcement, one of the very, very fundamental pieces of information that I shared with them was that it was critically important to me that this entire process be kept confidential, anonymous. You know, you can do with, with this, with whatever you want, leave me out of, you know, leave my name out of it, you leave, leave my family out of it. You, know, you, you do your police things and your investigative things, enjoy, but I, you know, no one can know that this is me. At some point, <clears throat> it became evident as this as this morphed from a police investigation to a courtroom investigation that there was a possibility that I might have to come forward. Yeah, at some point, the system isn't guaranteed that it can protect me, and I was I was toying with the idea of coming forward on my own terms. And uh, there was one night, um, my kids were in bed, and I was sitting in this exact same room where I'm sitting right now. Uh, I was sitting on the other side of the room, and the reason why I bring that up is because I'm looking right now. Um, we have a beautiful uh, three foot by two foot canvas print of the Rebbe on our on our wall, and right now I'm 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 looking at it, and where I was sitting when this episode happened, it was it was over my shoulder, uh, and and the reason why I bring this up is because one night I'm sitting at home and I'm really grappling with whether it's a good idea to tell my story publicly or not, and so I, I sat down in my in my living room and I pulled out my laptop as I am now and I googled uh, male Orthodox survivor of child sexual abuse, just to find out, you know, who else had done it and what that process looked like for them. And in 2019, the Google search came up empty. Uh, it's very rare that, that, that Google, you know, literally kind of spits you back an error message and was like, sorry, man, we, we, we can't help you, you know, maybe try rearranging those keywords, <laughs> but uh, we've got, we've got nothing here for you. I, try, I rearranged the keywords and, and also it came up empty. And at, at that moment, I remember feeling extremely dejected, you know, gosh, there's no one to talk to, no one, like no one out there is telling me. And at that moment, I, I, there's this big Rebbe picture on our wall and, and you, I almost felt you know, the Rebbe's gaze boring into my shoulder from behind me. And, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, as Shluchim, the Rebbe at its, at its core with the, with, the, with the concept of Shluchim, the Rebbe challenged us to rethink how we look at any empty space in life. So, if, you know, Rabbi Epstein, 30, 30 odd years ago, you were a nice younger man living in, in, in Crown Heights and you and your wife had no connection to you know, Chicago and, and my parents had no connection to Utah. And you're made aware of a, of a need. You're made aware of a void. And, and, and the Rebbe taught us that we can either be made aware of that void and be like, oh, you know, there's Jews in Chicago who, who could use more Yiddish guide. You know, it's very unfortunate. It must be very difficult to be them. Or or we can think to ourselves, oh, well, wow, you know, if I'm made aware of this need, it's a need for me to step into. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not made aware of needs for no reason. And I challenged myself in that moment to think about that space the same way. You know, if, if I'm made aware of, of this vacancy in, in, in the world, in this space, you know, that there's no one else out there, maybe that's why there's that space for someone to step into. Uh, and, and that was that played a tremendous role in, in making the decision to come forward publicly and to tell the story publicly was was that thought process of, of maybe there's someone that could be helped by this. Maybe there's some good in the world that could come about through this. And ultimately, that's what I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for the fact that I had the ability to think about the situation that way and to indeed step into that space and, and be able to create good for other people. Okay, we're going to keep the rabbit just for a few more minutes. If anybody wants to unmute and jump in with a question. We'll allow it. Keep it, please, brief and questions, not uh, alternative speeches. So where are you up to now? Now it's three years ago you studied, you've written this book. What's been the conclusion of the legal process? Uh, well, 
funny you asked that today. The legal process is still ongoing. I actually got an email today about a, a, a pending parole hearing. Uh, the, the legal process, in a certain sense, resolved itself, I guess would be the correct way to say it. You know, there was a guilty verdict uh, and, a, and a lengthy prison sentence attached to it. Um, and, um, you know, you, you, you learn to pick up the pieces and move on. In a certain sense, I think survivors who work their way through the criminal justice system come to understand that at a certain level, there's, there's only so much closure that you can get from a judge in a gaffle. And, and a lot of healing is in so your abuser was convicted and, and sentenced to jail. My abuser was convicted and sentenced and, and is doing a tremendously long time at Utah State Prison and continues to to you know absolutely maintain her innocence and that this was all a witch hunt and a misunderstanding and you know whatever. Um, and and as I said, you know, as a, as a survivor, I think you come to understand that that healing and recovery from, from any sort of experience is a personal journey, it's an internal journey and, and the courts can do what they can do and, and, and the system as it were can do what it can do. And, and you need to do what you need to do. And, and that, that doesn't change the, the responsibility. And I think you know, the, the personal work goes on and continues to go on and it continues to be a daily journey in that sense. You had a message to share with parents. What would you say that you learned in this experience that you could share with parents? So one of the things that's been most interesting for me is when I, you know, when I came forward, obviously I was speaking about my experience as a child, but when I came forward, I was already on the other side of the fence. When I came forward in 2019, I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old and, and I was already a parent. Uh, I was already responding to, you know, to the other side of the equation. And I think if there's one thing I've learned as a parent, it's, <clears throat> you know, I was blessed by the aid of two with two remarkable parents, two very caring, loving parents. Uh, I don't think that what happened to me happened because they were somehow, God forbid, negligent or, you know, they, they missed something. Uh, not at all. Um, and I think at a certain point as parents, it, it is important to remember that the world is a scary world out there sometimes. It's a big world. And there's a limit to how much we can control about the experiences that our children can go through. And it's far more important to dedicate those efforts to creating an environment where our children feel like there's no topic in the world that they might feel shameful in discussing with us. Uh, the, the, nothing is off the table in, in, in our discussions with our parents. There's no topic that should cause them to feel any sort of guilt in, in bringing up to us. And on the contrary, perhaps if there's a conversation where they feel like they're, they're uncomfortable to discuss it because of a perception that they might have that it might lead them to a certain feeling of guilt, that itself should be the greatest indicator that it's something which they should discuss with us. And so as a parent, it's something which I try to internalize you know, quite a bit is, is reinforcing that to my own children that th there should be no topic that is that is out of bounds or off the table or, or is too much or is, is too, too whatever, whatever it is, they should know that there's always going to be a listening and accepting ear on this side. Well, Rabbi, I want to thank you for spending your time. We revere your courage and bravery. We look forward to reading your book when it comes out in a couple of months. And um, we're honored and humbled to have you join us, but you're not getting your Parcheesi game back. So I'm afraid to... not. Um, that, I've, that, I've already, that, that healing of recovery, I've already, I've already done away with that. Okay, well, thank you very much. We really appreciate well, it. Everyone is welcome. Click on the link that I put in the chat. You can pre-order the book on Amazon. Uh, taking orders now. It'll be available, as the rabbi said, in a couple of weeks. Uh, tomorrow night, we'll learn Mimer. We thank Rabbi Zippo for his time. Wish you Hatzlacha and your Shlichas and in the journey that you have taken on to be a voice for, for the voiceless. Thank you so much. Good night to everybody. Thank you, Rabbi Epstein.